Well, thank you, Vince, very much. We definitely want to stay connected to you and your organization as we continue this journey uh, together. Uh, if we could have the next panel come up, understanding current uh, threat environment, and we'll get, we'll get started. Um, remember what I said in the opening comments, we wanted to really make sure we're all on the same page concerning the current threat environment. That way we could build from there and uh, take the next steps in, in learning more today. And that's what we'll be doing in our next module. Uh, Rich Esposito, who is NYPD Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Communications, now retired, is going to serve as our uh, moderator. Uh, we've got Rebecca Weiner, Assistant Commissioner of Intelligence Bureau, NYPD. Dr. Sarjan Goel, um, International Security Director for Asia Pacific Foundation, and Rich Stanick, uh, who we've gotten to know very well, who's co-founder of the Public Safety Strategic Group, LLC. So Rich, uh, I'll, turn it, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. It's always great to have some people between me and John Miller, because it's very, very hard to come on after John. Um, but one of the things John said is there are a lot of people who were dealt a terrible hand uh, by destiny. Um, and in, in the NYPD, as John knows, there are people making a movie now for the last two years about victims whose lives continue to be affected by the illnesses um, that they suffered. Um, there are a lot of victims who, from the law enforcement and first responder community, who continue to suffer in ways that we can't even imagine, even this group. Um, so um, that's something that John and I got to see firsthand, and um, they were dealt a terrible hand as well as the people who died that day. Um, and they did it, as John said, um, running toward danger, um, which is what they do. So it was a sunny September morning, as was mentioned in the movie, as was alluded to by John. Um, and since that day, since that September day, uh, the associations are no longer the most terrifying thing as going back to school. When you walk out into the sunlight now, 21 years later, um, the world has changed. So I'm, I'm honored to be here and fortunate to be with this group of panelists. Um, they're the membrane for our society. They're the people who hunt, find, analyze, assess, make the decisions as to what we look at, how we look at it, and what we do about it. Um, Rebecca, Rich Stanek, Sajun, um, they look at everything from, you know, Al-Zawahiri to um, people in Minnesota who are supposed to be ice fishing, but instead are heading to um, conflict zones and then coming back while Rich is trying to put his boat in the water. Um, you know, and um, Rebecca here in Manhattan has a global view and a local interest in the largest city in this country, um, the largest target, many would say, in this country. Um, so, what they're going to talk about today, my job is easy, it's just to sort of point and say, what do you think, um, is um, our domestic situation, our threat environment, the landscape, how has it changed in 21 years? What resources have we put towards the problem? Are they the right resources? Have we taken away too many resources over the course of time? Things erode, we all know that. Nothing continues without energy put into it. Um, and what about the stakeholders, the victims? What are we doing in the communities today differently? John mentioned some of it, Mary mentioned some of it, but why don't we first just do a, sort of a reverse lightning round in one or two words. What is today's problem, Rebecca? One or two words. It's okay, three. It's impossible. Uh, first of all, thank you to Mary, to Frank, to Sue for inviting us here. Uh, incredibly important reminder, which we in law enforcement need on a daily basis of exactly why we do what we do. Uh, so thank you to all the victims, communities, and advocates. Um, the threats are many. Five very quick ones. They're all very important in no particular order. 
domestic terrorism. We've talked a bit about that uh, so far this morning, from neo-Nazis to anti-government extremists. Uh, we are in a period of great change in this country, and we're staring down the barrel at another very fraught election cycle in which many Americans trust conspiracy theories that they see on the internet more than one another, certainly more than the institutions that are there to safeguard them. That's important. Number two, and we'll hopefully get to talk a bit more about this, we all learned six weeks ago that the leader of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, felt very comfortable moving back to Kabul, downtown Kabul, within six months of the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. That's significant. Three is Iran. You know, in the wake of a fairly brazen spate of plots, assassination, kidnapping, plots against U.S. officials and Iranian dissidents, you had a 24-year-old from New Jersey a couple weeks ago um, try to fulfill a fatwa that was created by the government of Iran to attack Salman Rushdie a decade before he was even born, so a big one. Um, there's also a land war happening in Ukraine, and you've got myriad state and sub-state actors who are in this conflict zone involved in active combat in and around a nuclear energy facility. So what could possibly go wrong there? But the one that I think is probably the most important for all of us in this room is the issue of youth violence. And this, across the ideological spectrum, is something that practitioners among us are all grappling with, younger and younger offenders. And this is quite literally bleeding over into the realm of conventional crime, gun violence as well. So as we are thinking about 21 years past 9-11, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a generation of young kids um, for whom we're at a risk of creating a really pernicious cycle where offenders become victims, victims become offenders. And what are we to do about that? Thank you. So what do you see from your point of view? Sure. Well, firstly, um, let me just say thank you to um, everybody for the very kind invitation to, to speak here today. Um, if I can just also just briefly mention my gratitude to everyone for expressing their condolences for the Queen passing away, because that was pretty tough uh, coming from the UK, landing here last night, and then being informed as to what had happened. Um, and the Queen actually has a very solid bond with the US, and especially the people of New York because we are here to remember 9-11. And uh, on September 13th, 2001, the Queen ordered her, uh, her band to play the US national anthem uh, at Buckingham Palace yeah, to remember those that died. And that was unprecedented. It's never happened prior. It's never happened subsequently. Uh, so the, uh, the Queen had huge admiration for the people of America. And it's just so nice to hear so many people from the US express their condolences. Re Rebecca, in many ways, covered a lot of the, the key themes that I was also going to touch upon. What I would probably add to this is, if you look at the global threats, Russia, China, the pandemic, climate change, uh, the cost of living, these now seem to be dominating our headlines and taking up a lot of bandwidth. But if you actually think about it, all of that is interconnected to terrorism. Uh, because what the role of state actors are doing in fueling it, in creating tensions in some countries, in also uh, in perniciously creating a migrant flow that could potentially then impact, that has also knock-on consequences. Oh, and now I'm moving on to this. Uh, so uh, the, there are various different challenges uh, that ultimately are coming into play. but. The key thing about all of this is, as I mentioned about Russia, China, climate change, the pandemic, the cost of living, is it is directly connected to transnational terrorism. Uh, that is only going to potentially raise its ugly head. Uh, we may have moved away from Afghanistan, but the problems in Afghanistan remain. As Rebecca mentioned, the head of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawari, chose to live in Kabul. And when we get to talk about that, I can go into more detail just how disturbing it is and how confident al-Qaeda feels being back in Afghanistan. There are the al-Qaeda affiliates in, uh, in Yemen, AQAP, AQIS in Pakistan, 
And then you've also got the affiliates in sub-Saharan Africa. They are there. They're growing. They're expanding. There are spores of ISIS affiliates also uh, re-emerging. And all these different conditions, such as the pandemic, climate change, the cost of living, that are impacting on the West, these groups are hoping that the West ignores and forgets a lot of those other places. And my concern is, is that at some point we will start seeing foreign terrorist fighters moving to these places again from our respective countries. And then on top of that, the other dynamic that I think is so important is the misogyny angle. When we look at these groups and we think that they're purely ideological, that actually doesn't tell the full story because many of them are motivated by misogyny, by repressing the rights of women. They want to have that violence against women as well. So I think these are the angles that uh, concern me as, as we move forward. Thank you, Sergeant. Rich, um, what is the key issue that's on your mind? Yeah, do I need to use the uh, microphone or does that uh, wireless mic? You're good. Perfect. Well, I, I want to say this. I mean, I, I had a chance to meet Mary and Frank about uh, maybe 10 years ago. We were on Mackinac Island. We were sitting around a fire pit. Some may have been smoking a cigar. Or others may have been enjoying a glass of wine. I did not know who they were. Uh, they had come to the Major County Sheriff's Association uh, fall meeting. Uh, they were sheriffs there from all over the country, from the largest of agencies, of which Kevin is going to inherit one here pretty quickly, and he's going to do a phenomenal job for us. Uh, but we sat around talking that night, and I understood both the passion and the commitment, and they had the sheriffs astonished with what it was that they were, what they had built, where they were headed, and now here we are 10, 11, 12 years later, you're continuing every single day to work. You had said something about, you know, some of us in law enforcement, you know, I put in 38 years, 25 years as a local Minneapolis police officer, 12 years as a sheriff. I was a commissioner of public safety for my governor, director of Homeland Security, uh, when it first came around before DHS was even built. And, uh, a state legislator, and I think about you know going back in time and understanding how far we've come. You know, uh, Secretary Mayorkas is going to join us uh, later this afternoon, early evening at the symposium. His agency didn't even exist <laughs> back then. We didn't have a director of national intelligence. The 9/11 Commission report it really didn't strike me till I was sitting over here listening to. Commissioner Miller this morning talked about the 9-11 Commission, some of the things that came out of it for us in law enforcement, like interoperable radio systems, FirstNet and 800 megahertz, and all the resources that have come uh, over the years. I am very pleased to be here. When I look out and I say, well, you know, after 38 years in policing, what are the greatest things that I see that affect our chiefs and our sheriffs, the men and women? who serve on the front lines every single day with our federal partners. Uh, it would be one, domestic, bio, domestic uh, extremism and terrorism. Not necessarily international, but right here in this country. You, know, you went over several of them, from Parkland to Obadi to shopping malls, churches and synagogues and others. Um, secondly would be violent crime and the steady increase over the last <coughs> couple years in this country. And resources for us, uh, most importantly, the, uh, the resources in terms of personnel. There was a defund the police movement that was a horrible experiment and disastrous, uh, yet it continues on to some degree by the reduced staffing levels of American law enforcement agencies. I would say, and Vince may or may not agree, by the way, Vince Tellucci, uh, stand-up guy, right? He runs the IECP. That is by which all of us continue to receive our training, resources, and our networking. But I'd say 15, 16, 17 percent, at least in my state of Minnesota, reduced staffing. Uh, that's something that we have to make up. And, you know, there is no hope in sight in near term to be able to, to do that. This country is changing tremendously. But those are the three key things that I think about that are emerging issues and problems. You've got a great panel up here, Rich, uh, you know, with the doctor and Rebecca and what they bring to the table. Mine's just a little flavor of what local law enforcement sees out there and what we're feeling every single day. So thank you for having us. By the way, James uh, Raymer is here. He's the president of Linked 
Alumni Association. He may have been stuck in traffic, but his commitment is to be here, and here he is. So thank you uh, for being here. Thanks, thanks, Rich. And John, you can prepare for your deposition with me for the protest and the defund the police movement. We'll be spending the next several months, I believe, in, uh, in hearings. But, um, I got one answer for everything. Ask I use the same. I, I use the one from my old neighborhood. I don't recall. <laughs> it's like, um, so, so I think one of the one of the themes that everybody hit on is misogyny and hate. And beyond, whether it's domestic extremism, whether it's a consequence of us, our departure from Afghanistan and how it impacts the empowerment of women, misogyny and hate are two of the drivers that um, we often don't really identify just that way. But whether it's a lone actor or a conspiracy and you sit, sit down and say, what what, what, what is it that drives these people? And, and John has gone out on raids and you go to somebody's house and they're a Black Panther literature in one drawer and in the computer there's some stuff from ISIS. And then, of course, there's usually pornography and like some strange weaponry that, like a samurai sword. And you're like, what is it that drives these people? So somebody want to take a stab at what what is is hate evolved in our society? Is that changing too? Rebecca, maybe sure. you want to give that a try? Absolutely. And you know, Sajan and I have, have talked a lot about this issue. Uh, it's an incredibly important one. And so starting off in, in the realm of hate, you know, when we think about domestic terrorism and everybody's brought up that as uh, a significant issue that we're confronting, you've got different types, and they've all been exemplified tragically recently. So you look at Buffalo, and Commissioner Miller mentioned Buffalo earlier. Classic neo-Nazi attack, horrific attack, that is absolutely by the book, copying Christchurch, but also referencing the pantheon of other horrific neo-Nazi, what we call accelerationist attacks. Then you fast forward to July 4th, and you've got um, a, a shooting in Highland Park. And that was a little bit confusing to us. This individual seemed motivated by pure nihilism and hate and a little bit of misogyny and a little bit of perhaps numerology and a little bit of neo-Nazi ideology. But really, it's about nihilism and the desire to just burn it all down. Uh, you see this over and over in our domestic landscape, and you see it in the international landscape as well. And so a theme that links together ideologies, but also not really ideological violence, uh, is suppression, violent suppression of others, whether the others are, you know, in the case of Buffalo, it was the black community. In the case of incel incidents, it's women. So there's certainly uh, a trend in which the hate and the violence is maybe justified on the back end by the ideology, but the ideology isn't necessarily driving the hate and the violence. And so, again, collectively, how do we grapple with that degree of nihilism and hate? So what do you think? Um, is some of this a consequence of our rapid departure from Afghanistan? Has that fueled the change in hate, the growth of hate? What is, what you've been looking at this, you've been writing a book on the subject, what, what's going on as a result of our departure from Afghanistan? Sure. Well, thank you, and please let me know if I'm not being heard correctly or not. Hopefully, this uh, and buy the book; it's, it'll be out soon. But <laughs> <laughs> well, firstly, thank you for the plug for my book. Yes, uh, I'm, my book is on Ayman al Zawari, who was the leader of Al Qaeda, uh, and the title had already been set, and then. The U.S. Uh, intelligence community decided to kill him inconveniently and change my title of my book. Uh, so um, yes. that will be updated. Uh, but no, firstly, I have to, to pay credit to what the U.S. intelligence and defense communities did in tracking him down in Afghanistan. Uh, that was incredible. And it was not easy, especially as the U.S. is not present there. But to, to deal with your question, Rich. So the thing is this, is that if you look at where misogyny has become state-sanctioned and institutionalized, 
in the last 30 years. It was in Afghanistan during the first Taliban reign in the mid-90s. It's now again in Afghanistan with the Taliban having returned. And then you had it in Syria and Iraq with uh, ISIS uh, having controlled uh, th th those territories there. The th misogyny is very much a cornerstone of what these groups want to uh, further their agenda in because they don't want women to play a role, whether it's in terms of governance, education, uh, playing a role in civil society. They want to have their own medieval, warped ideological uh, control, branding, doctrine. And the best way to do that is to subjugate uh, women. I think one of the great tragedies that has happened recently in Afghanistan is that the Ministry of Women's Affairs that was created to give women equality, equal rights, that was shut down by the Taliban and it was repurposed very perversely to the Ministry of Vice and Promotion of Virtue. And that is basically the misogyny ministry. Because what that does is, is it has taken women out of the employment. They are no longer allowed to work. They're no longer allowed to be educated. In Afghanistan today, the only actual uh, mode of earning money for a woman is to beg on the streets. That is how warped it's become. And it leads to everything else. Because once you create a society of misogyny, you will have foreign fighters who are motivated by that aspect. Those people that think they can go there, have brides, force themselves on women, have women as slaves. This happened in Afghanistan in the 90s. It enabled Al Qaeda to grow. It happened with ISIS uh, post Arab Spring which uh, resulted in a huge flock of foreign fighters from our respective countries. And then it's going to happen, I fear, subsequently again. And I would just mention that the new Ministry of, uh, of, of Vice and Virtue happened to be right next door to where Ayman al-Zawari was found. So there's this connection with terrorism repeatedly, and it's often used just to, one, to purport their agenda, but two, is actually, it's more about controlling women. You know, there was a book about this many, many years ago called The Ministry of Fear, mm -hmm. different form of terror, 70 years ago. Um, but be before we get to Rich's unique perspective on this, you know, you should be very thankful to the CIA for preparing a happy ending for your book. Um, you know, they don't, usually they just redact things. This time they canceled it and gave you a happy ending. It's a, it's like, you, they solve such a problem for you. I was, you know, we struggle with these things all the time. Rich, you had a unique perspective on the community. Sue's had a similar one in Canada and the role of women in our immigrant communities from these conflict zones and just how important empowerment of women is in these communities. You saw it in the Somali communities up in Minnesota. Can you look at this issue through that lens and, and sort of answer some of Sajura's quest, questions that he raises? What, what can we do in a positive way for our stakeholders? Yeah, well, first off, you don't have to change the title of your book. You can leave his photo on the front, just put a big line through it. That's what, that's what I would do, a simplistic uh, method. Uh, you know, we've been talking about El Zawahiri for, shoot, I was sheriff for 12 years, twice a month, every two weeks, Joint Terrorism Task Force, executive level meetings, sitting in the FBI office, talking about this guy and the dirty deeds that he has done, and where do we find them? So kudos to the uh, U.S. government and armed forces for taking him out when they did. Um, sooner the better. That was good. Uh, let me say this about... Uh, I used to serve, I served as the former president of Linked Alumni Association, so I had a chance to participate over the years, and many of you in the room and listening online uh, may recall several years ago, uh, Julianne Ortman and myself brought a, a young woman named Dekka Hussein. Uh, she was traditional uh, Somali Muslim woman, right, from the hijab. Uh, everything in between. And I remember, you know, you were kind enough, Commissioner, to arrange transportation at the airport for us. That was great. She came in on a later flight out of Minnesota to present to this group. And uh, you had to send a couple of detectives out to uh, get her at the airport. And we happened to catch the same detectives the next day as we were heading back to the airport. And they're like, 
who was that woman we brought in last night? She just sat in the back of our SUV as quiet as could be. And we said, well, you know, her son was a convicted terrorist, no big deal. He's serving time in federal prison. And that's the kind of people that linked Alumni Association brought to the table. Really, I, I think all of you agree, hate is pervasive in our society. And no matter what type of crime we investigate on a local law enforcement level, hate is a part of it. Um, we always talk about, and we used to always uh, kid uh, our federal partners that uh, terrorism, international terrorism, great. But what we see every day on a local level is uh, violent extremism and uh, much like January 6th, right? I mean, l local, local grown, homegrown, things that happen here. People who do not believe in the government, if the government has an overreach, it goes a little bit too far. We believe, I had a county of 1.3 million people that were responsible for the safety and security of. A couple hundred thousand of those 1.3 million population were Somalian and East African immigrants who came to this country for a better life. They came through refugee camps, they came through the churches and the good systems, and they wanted to relocate. We used to always uh, tell folks that they did not want to um, assimilate into the American culture. They wanted to integrate into the American culture. They wanted to keep alive things that were important to them and the traditions and customs that they held so near in deer, but they did not want to assimilate. And many people were scared to death of them. We had a lot of people come out of Minnesota to go back overseas to fight in the great jihad. Many of these young men and women were born here in the United States. They were first generation Americans, uh, yet they went back. And so we worked on empowering women. Uh, we had an East African women's group of which DECA participated and helped teach other young women, moms, because we knew moms always cared about what happens with their kids. It didn't matter what it was, it didn't matter what they did. Uh, her son was part of something called the JFK, I think it was five. You know, we followed them around Minnesota for months and months and months till they finally decided they can't do it in Minnesota. They can't get out of the country from Minnesota. So let's go to, let's go to New York out of JFK and get out. Uh, but they weren't able to do that either, right? Just like uh, Commissioner Miller had talked about, undercovers and all that works. Uh, but she was great in terms of helping educate other young women and moms uh, how to work with local authorities. She didn't want bad things to happen to her son. She helped her son turn the corner uh, to cooperate with us. Um, that was a big, that was a big deal. And through her service, she was able to help local and federal law enforcement understand a little bit better about what happens. But I, I encourage, right? I mean, this thing about empowering women, empowering victims, speak up. Uh, it is a big, it is a big deal. And hate is pervasive in our society. We're gonna continue to see it every single day. Sovereign citizens, uh, you name it. Can I add one thing? I think it's important in the conversation about misogyny. It's very easy to focus on women as victims, and that's a really important part. But I think yet another reason that we do need to have more women as change agents in this field. So looking at Mary and Sue, who've been at this for, for decades now, is very important. And it's important to young women who are thinking of entering this field uh, to view themselves as, as particularly capable of helping change certainly narratives around misogyny uh, and also hate for all, all those reasons. So just bouncing for a second off that do you have the resources are our resources in the right places today when 9 11 happened we didn't have a lot of resources because sort of the 1993 event was like the snowflakes that morning it came and it went and everyone forgot about it um and the events that happened in 2000 the, the events before 9 11 never really led to the proper community outreach the proper input into the Muslim communities, into the other communities. Now, 21 years later, we've got a rise in crime. We've got smaller police departments. We have tighter budgets. 
Are you getting what you need? We'll start with Rebecca. Are you getting the resources you need at the police department? Well, so there's a couple of constraints on resources. You just mentioned a few. There's budgets, right? And those have been tightening over the years. And cyclically, we've had periods of relative plenty and periods of relative uh, constraint and, and we're in a different budgetary environment than we were a couple years ago. So that's one issue. Um, equally important, I think, are some basic structural supply chain challenges that we've confronted in the law enforcement domain. So is our criminal justice system working at a very basic level? And the answer is it really isn't in many ways. And laws have changed and political will has swayed. And so resources aren't just financial, but they really have to do with, again, the trust and willingness to engage in institutions that are all created to safeguard our society. And in that realm, uh, we are not getting what we need. Um, and we probably do need to rethink some of the legislative change at a local level and maybe at a federal level that have led us to a period of great increases in crime. And that's quite aside from the terrorism context, but very important. And the reason it's very important is that as crime goes up, and Chief Gulati spends a lot of time thinking and talking about this, uh, the ability to focus on some of these rarer but uh, terrorizing threats that we spend our days and nights concerned about diminishes. And so we have increases in crime locally that deflect away from the CT mission. Also around the world, preoccupation by the international intel community and U.S. involved in all these nation-state-driven issues. So people are thinking about Russia and thinking about China. And does that leave us open to more threats emanating from Afghanistan or West or East Africa or Syria? So there are all these competing priorities that help create an environment where we don't have the focus and the resources uh, that we did you know, in the, the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Of but one of the things you hit on that's a very important point is political will. Um, political will is how in Vietnam we lost our lens on a conflict, um, and they did not. So they were quite willing to keep fighting because they had the political will, and we did not. The Taliban, uh, they seem to have phenomenal will. They seem to, we have once again left Afghanistan. It's um, a little bit analogous to, what, what, to prior conflicts that we've been in and then we've walked out of. Um, not saying it's wrong to have left, but what's the consequence of having left? They seemed quite competent at continuing to evolve the threat there. So why don't we, political will, and are you getting the resources you need for that part of the conflict? Sure. Well, th th this is a really important uh, conversation that we're having. Um, I don't think there is any political desire from any country to go back into uh, Afghanistan anytime soon, and I can I can understand that uh, as well. The thing I would say is is that, and I think this is where there was a, a failure to understand the ground realities in many ways, is that President Obama very correctly ended combat operations in Afghanistan back in 2014. So the so-called forever war actually ended a while back. But no one actually had that discussion with people. So people thought the conflict was continuing. The cost of being there went down. The fatalities also went down. And I would point out that the US and other countries are present in Japan, South Korea, and Germany since uh, the since the end of the first, sorry, since the end of the Second World War, and then in Korea post the Korean War. So U.S. has got its foot on the ground in, in many different places. When we were in Afghanistan, we were able to keep an eye on what was taking place. You had the ability to stop terrorists from operating there and then from using that as a platform to carry out attacks uh, elsewhere. Now we're not there anymore. You've got the Taliban who are running the country. And it's really important to remember that al-Qaeda could not have planned the 9-11 attacks without the Taliban giving them home sanctuary and support. And if you think about the date today, which is the 9th of September, this is also a very important uh, anniversary date as well, because it's the 21st anniversary of the assassination of Ahmed Shah Massoud, the leader of the Northern Alliance, which Ayman al-Zawari, by the way, led. 
without killing Ahmed Shah Massoud, 9-11 may never have actually happened, mm. because that enabled uh, the, the planning for al-Qaeda and the Taliban to, to see if they can try and stop the U.S. in its tracks. So the resources, I think, are getting now tied up with dealing with Russia and China, and very understandably, because that is a huge uh, challenge, and this great power competition is now dominating our theme. But I think that the terrorism dynamic is uh, perhaps not getting the focus it needs to. And unfortunately, what will happen down the road is that you will see Afghanistan becoming that cesspool for extremism. You will see the foreign fighters going there. They will come back. There will be attacks. And then suddenly our politicians will say, oh, well, where did this happen? Why won't we paying attention uh, to it? So I think we just have to keep on uh, all of these factors in mind as to what is transpiring outside our borders. Thank you. Rebecca, what's the volume like that comes in? The, you guys are sort of, you, Chief Galati, your units are sort of the membrane between society and the threat. So you have the decision making. Are, the, are these the threats we want to focus on? How, what's the volume like? Tell, tell this group what, what you see. Well, the cadence is certainly higher. It's been steadily increasing over the last 21 years. You know, we spend a lot of time looking at plots against New York and um, over half of the over 50 plots against New York in the last two decades have come in the last five or six years. So that's a sizable increase. But I think um, to continue the membrane metaphor, there's also an increasing porousness between um, what we see in the digital realm and what we see in the physical realm. So Cincinnati, three days after the Mar-a-Lago search warrant. An individual who's armed with an AR-15 and a nail gun tries to breach the FBI field office, um, animated by lots of grievance about this search warrant and the FBI in general. Right, That took 72 hours to manifest. So cadence is much higher. Um, plots are quite simple. Do you even call that a plot? Or do you call that somebody just acting out in a spasm of violence, which leaves us um, here in New York at the NYPD, but across the country and around the world, forced to contend with a very short wick that we have um, to navigate before we can try to mitigate a, a threat. So volume is higher. Cadence is higher, diversity is higher, and um, we have to stay on top of it. So, look, thank you so much for that, Rebecca. Uh, Sh Sheriff Stanek, you have the perspective of someone who ha would have to live with the role of prosecutors today. Were you still in your old job, you'd be facing what John wrote in an editorial on last week when he left the police department, um, where, in a sense, he's basically said our prosecutors have thrown us back decades in the ability to fight violent crime. And as Rebecca said earlier, violent crime can't really be separated from the other issues bef that of, of fighting terrorism. What do you think of our current national stance on prosecution? Well, John, keep up, uh, uh, keep hammering away at it because you know what's right. <laughs> and you can help us uh, tremendously as you have been. You know, some would say. He who speaks the truth should have at least one foot in the stirrup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, like I said, you know, violent crime <laughs> rising rapidly across, uh, across this country. And I, I, I mean, you just go back to September 11th of 2001. People talk about homeland security. Homeland security meant nothing to local law enforcement. They were two individual words that were disconnected. And over a period of time, well, there was some connection. Today, every law enforcement officer uh, understands homeland security and has a different connotation. Even when I was appointed uh, homeland security advisor in Minnesota in 2003, uh, there was no job description. The governor said, you're commissioner of public safety. I said, great, thank you. I'm going to do a great job for you. And by the way, you also got to do homeland security advisor. Well, what the heck did that mean? Now, he couldn't even define it. And you know, here we are now, 21 years later, a lot of things happening. If Vince would tell you, from 850,000 local police officers out there to 18,000 law enforcement agencies, chiefs and sheriffs, 3,100 sheriffs and 15,000 plus police chiefs, 
uh, we've all got different mission sets, but we all had things that we had to to do. Homeland Security was added on top of that. We had rape, robberies, murders, aggravated assaults, thefts, burglaries, all kinds of things. Some say this rise in violent crime is a result of the pandemic. How many do believe that? Good, none. Don't believe it. Look, I mean, uh, some say it's, uh, it's a result in the change in the bail hearings and the bail structure. And I would say most people in the room would probably say they're getting in tune with that. Some would say maybe uh, uh, young people, right, not being held accountable. What happens if you're not held accountable and immediately accountable for their actions? Well, you get, you get what you get, and you get this exponential rise in violent crime. I think it is cyclical. I think it'll start to level off and come back down. I'm not even sure we've reached its peak. But this is what local law enforcement worries about every single day. Sovereign citizens, just like what Rebecca just described with the FBI, the guy with the AR-15 and the nail gun. Uh, look, it took three days to, uh, to manifest. I'm sure that the threats were through the roof in terms of local law enforcement and our federal friends. They were doing their job. Some people don't agree with that job. This country has changed tremendously politically. Look at where we've come over 21 years from the presidents in between and the cabinets and legislators themselves. Um, things are changing and it's up to us, right? Uh, you in the room, you online. Uh, I think about victims groups, right? There wasn't even a whole lot said about victims rights and uh, how they were treated over the years and mass casualties and these terrorism incidents. You know, we had a bridge collapse back in Minnesota in 2007, August 1st of 2007 at 6.03 p.m. We had 164 people who were injured, some critically. 13 died. You know, five of them were still missing. It took us 21 days to recover them from under the waters of a turbulent river. And we had hundreds more who were missing, right? Just didn't simply report in. We didn't know if they were coming or going or going or coming. Uh, and we had, there was no training for us on how to deal with victims and victim assistance. And we remember walking into uh, uh, a hotel, a Marriott, much like this one near the University of Minnesota. And there was a room of people with individual tables. And each table had a family of someone who we thought was probably, uh, we had eight confirmed dead, five missing, 13 tables in the room. And yet there was a young woman sitting at a table and I went up and spoke to her and, you know, her daughter had a traumatic brain injury. So her husband was not able to, to, to travel with her to Minnesota and she was by herself. There was nobody there to help her. We learned a tremendous amount. Sue and Mary and Frank and all of you in the room that work with victims. Thank God you're here. Thank God that you are on top of it every single day. You are teaching us what we could not have done for ourselves. I'm sorry, uh, Rich, a little off topic, but had to be said on behalf of local law enforcement. There's, there's, there's absolutely nothing to apologize for in that, that amazing set of um, statements. Um, we have youth violence. We have extremists who act alone. And we have a midterm election cycle in a divided society. How worried about violence should we be? Rebecca, we'll start with you on this. Well, you shouldn't be worried about violence because that's our job, right? Okay. To, to, to help deal week, with yeah. it. Um, <laughs> no, 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 of course. It, it, so a lot of different issues and there's the youth violence piece, there's the election cycle piece, which we've we've spoken about. Um, and then there's the speed with which threats materialize piece. And, and I think that's the, the most confounding of all of it, um, all of which uh, are undergirded by, as we've talked about, um, distrust of police, distrust of government, distrust of the news. Uh, maybe that will change with Commissioner Miller's new role. You got it. <laughs> um, everybody's getting their information from a different set of facts. Truth lies inconsequential. Um, and hackneyed as it may seem, it's really important that the role of social media in radicalizing all of us 
to whatever issue is our pet issue against whatever other is our pet whatever other, um, that's really insidious. And, and it's, from a public safety perspective, dangerous. But I think more fundamentally, it just creates divisions within our society, which we've seen manifest over the last few years in a way that certainly in my lifetime I've never seen before. Um, speaking to those who have been around and are wiser than me feels much like turbulent eras in the 1960s and 70s. And so what all this is leading to is instability and um, really a possibility that we're all dealing with currents that are going to force us out of even the little comfort zones that we've charted out for ourselves over the last two decades. So in, through your lens on the global scene, what does this divided America, what does our political difficulty, what does this tell the Taliban, Al Qaeda, ISIS, the people who you look at, what, what do they see when they see us? When you see the polarization in the U.S., it's, it's very disconcerting because you need to have a strong United States uh, because the U.S. is such an important positive force when it comes to helping other countries, when it comes to democracy, civil society, uh, working with them in terms of economic rebuilding as well, the post-pandemic uh, aftermath. And I think the challenge is, is that if the U.S. is tearing itself apart through various different uh, political and ideological divisions, and thankfully that I'm not American, so I don't have to get myself in the middle of that, but the problem is, as an outsider, it concerns me because there are these challenges where the, you, you're not necessarily looking at the, the, the threats that are emerging abroad uh, that are manifesting, that are growing at a very low level, uh, whether they are in Afghanistan and Pakistan once again, uh, in the Middle East, in sub-Saharan Africa. There are very disturbing early signs of terrorists uh, reforming. And the other thing is this, is that countries like Russia and China also benefit if the U.S. is divided, uh, because they can further their objectives. Russia, in particular, felt that there was an opportunity to stake a war in Ukraine. They made a big mistake because of the fact that they didn't think that the West would come together the way it has done, and that is so important. And I think what concerns me is that there are some people now losing their resolve when it comes to Ukraine, saying, why are we spending money there, that we've got our own economic problems. It's very important what's happening in Ukraine, because if Russia gets an edge, if it succeeds, it's going to send out a message that other countries can do what they want in invading other countries, taking territory, uh, subjugating uh, people. And this is where, again, the U.S. plays a very important role because it takes the lead in saying, no, you can't do that, that this aggression has to stop. And therefore, it is so important that the U.S. comes together in however way it can politically and, and actually be that united force for the world. Uh, and I think it's just so important for that to happen. Thank you very much. I think we, Mary is waving at me, which always scares me. Um, the last time it resulted in me. Were there questions on the screen? There are no questions on the screen. And so I was about to say we have about 15 minutes left. We're running a little bit behind. But um, why don't we take some questions? They're coming up now. Um, thank you. Um, Let's start with um, one of the questions from the, from the folks on, the, on that are on the screen. Do we think that misogyny has always played a part in terrorism and mass violence, or is it a new phenomena? Um, who wants to take a crack at that? <laughs> Go for it, Sasha. Okay. <laughs> well, I suspect this may have been planted for me. I'm not sure, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I saw him write it. Um, it's written yeah. out of the book. Yeah, I was typing it on my phone secretly. <laughs> I, I think it's always been part of uh, terrorism, misogyny, that is. I think it is a intertwined relationship. It's just we've not actually had that uh, discussion uh, before. But it's, it's just over my research, what I've noticed is that if you look at it from the history of terrorist movements, uh, that how do they treat people? And in particular, how do they treat women, women from their own communities? And, and I think one of the things is this, is that if women are taken outside uh, the workplace, if they are stopped from living their lives, 
that directly impacts negatively on society. Uh, it erodes the quality of that society uh, itself. If young, impressionable boys are taught that you know women are not there to be equal, they are basically there to be used and misused, it sends out a very, very bad message. And it's, the more women you have in the workplace, the more successful that society becomes. And one thing I said at the linked event in London, which I stand by, is that women's rights is counterterrorism, and that if you empower more women, it's actually going to be a positive force for uh, society. And this is why it's, it's so important to, to look at it, to address it, and to call out the misogyny angle wherever uh, it exists. And unfortunately, I don't think we do enough about it. But full credit to uh, a lot of the people here who work on LINKED, because they're now uh, going to address this th themselves. And Mary and Sue, two incredibly wonderful people, also are very keen on, on looking at this uh, further. So I, I'm, I'm glad that it's getting the attention. I would say it's late, that we've not addressed it enough before, and we're, we're all guilty of that. But we're now having that dialogue. And I think it's important to, to keep uh, having that conversation about misogyny and terrorism, because it can actually be addressed. And if we take away those individuals that are motivated by misogyny, you are going to reduce the number of potential terrorists that get recruited, whether it is transnational, whether it's neo-Nazi or whatever ideological motivation. That doesn't mean we're going to stop everybody. There will be some that are purely ideological and very hardcore. But I think you can take away a huge number of foot soldiers by trying to address the misogyny angle. Thank you, Sergio. The uh, Sergio has also asked, answered much of the second question on the screen right now. Um, it's never too late. It's never late. Um, Boston Marathon was just a few years ago, and how we approached who is a victim changed right that day. Um, how the FBI did their victim services changed that day. We didn't do it before. That doesn't mean it was late the day we did it. Misogyny has been a part of the societal conversation for a long time. Now it's a part of the counterterror conversation, the counterintelligence conversation. And late, early, we don't, we can't fix the past. We, we're here today, and today it's the issue on the table. It's clearly very present in this room. Um, so I, I thank you for bringing attention to it. We don't have any question on the screen right now, so I'm going to ask Chief Galati a question since he's right in front of me. Um, <laughs> Chief, what keeps you up at night? John said you are now in charge of not sleeping for the police department. Um, you can give me that mic. I'm good at this part. No, I sleep at night. Was, they say he's scary. You can come right up and sit down now. <laughs> no, I, I, I think what keeps me up at night right now is that, um, you know, I look at, and it was kind of talked about up here, but I look at, like, when we were, uh, you know, right after 9-11, all the resources really went. It was all Al-Qaeda all the time. And then, you know, as time went on, you know, we started seeing, you know, the messaging, ISIS, and, you know, but we were still focused on that. Today, we're focused on too many things, and I think that there's too many balls in the air, and we don't really, we're not focusing as much on what we need to. We're really focused on domestic terrorism, and, and that has many, many different aspects to it. You know, Rebecca even mentioned, like, incel and, and so on. So, you know, we're focused on that. School threats are through the roof. I mean, we go out on school threats every single day since school opened up. You know, my leads team, you know, they're getting four or five a day. So we're looking at that, you know. We're worried about Ukraine and Russia. The intel community is completely focused on that. Um, you know, Rebecca mentioned Iran. That's a real, real threat. Um, and it's not a threat over there. It's a threat right here. Um, you know, we're worried about China. And China is a huge threat. I mean, China has, um, you know, while we've been in this war for 21 years, China's really made advances here in the United States, so from the counterintelligence angle, uh, and then their influence around the world. So there are so many things going on. What is the intelligence community looking at right now? Is there enough looking at uh, what the doctor said? Um, because I agree with them 100 percent, what's going on in Afghanistan. You know, who's come here from Afghanistan right now? Um, a lot of refugees came in, and a lot of them were very helpful. But there were people that slipped in here that probably shouldn't have gotten here. and then. From that refugee angle, too, what we've seen in a lot of attacks in New York and around the country 
are people that come here as maybe refugees or you know immigrants and they, and they get here and they find it very difficult to assimilate into society so you know even though they didn't come here with the, the dream of being a terrorist or carrying out a terrorist attack over time they find themselves alone uh, you know they maybe don't have the job that they want they're failing in their family life um, you know I, I think of the one uh, suicide bomber that we had here you know he just wanted to go back to Bangladesh but his family wouldn't let him go back because he had to make money and send it back there so you know he missed his family he missed his son and you know he started looking online and you know reading and watching videos about ISIS so he came here with the good intentions but you know got radicalized on himself so I guess what I'm saying is there's so many things going on right now Intel community is all over the place are we putting enough resources into all the threats that we have and if we're not we're gonna get hit again like we did in the past so you are, you are, you're not really sleeping at night, but John, when John left, he said between you and Rebecca, he, him leaving was not a problem for the police department. And you can see that with you guys are on top of it. But one of the things- Don't worry, though. I'm doing the sleeping for both of them. You, I heard you were getting a good night's sleep. Like your children are happy that you're not bothering them in the middle of the night, <laughs> worrying them. But we were in, in London at one of the conferences, the, the guy who ran MI6 at the time said, you know, just because you want to investigate it doesn't mean you should investigate it. Just because you think it's important doesn't mean it is important. Mm. When I call you guys the membrane, that's what I'm referring to. Lots comes in, but there's just so many resources, even on a good day. So how do you decide what's the most important threat? How do you make that difficult choice when you just have X number of people? So um, I'll, I'll add one that I didn't add in in my last answer. So crime is a major problem. Crime is going up. Um, you know, uh, gun possession in this country is is up at an all-time high. 2020, and I don't know if it was a comp I think it's a combination of everything. I think it was um, an increase in crime, and then the pandemic, and then um, you know the George Floyd uh, uh, um, issues. That uh, I think there were 40 million. Uh, checks for people to buy guns, 8 million for the first time. Gun uh, possession has gone up. And even though you say these are legally bought guns, a lot of these guns throughout the, the country, and, and I'm sure the sheriff could tell you, uh, cars are uh, broken into, guns are stolen every day. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago in San Antonio. They had almost 1,900 guns stolen out of cars, I think, up into July. So that's a half a year. So all the guns that are hitting the street um, are now getting into the hands of, of the youth, uh, and, and you know the violence is, uh, you know. So right now, we have to focus on the violence more than anything and Rebecca said this we're starting to pull from our CT mission to make sure that we're addressing violence uh, in, in the streets that's our number one job you know when we have low crime then we can focus on all those other things you know we've seen what happened in Uvalde I mean these school threats that come in you know 95 percent of them are, are not you know, uh, really credible, but you can't treat them that way. You have to go out and everyone, you know, that's a real priority. And I will tell you, you know, I said 95%, the 5% that um, aren't are kids that are truly troubled. And you could uh, ask Rebecca on this, you know, we found some people that seriously, seriously, you know, um, you know, mental issues, incel types, you know, uh, you know, classic writing in a book about misogyny and, you know, attacking women and all these. And, you know, you got to get those kids and you got to get them some mental health right away. And, you know, you got to monitor them, too. You know, we try and check up sometimes on them with their parents, you know, get their parents involved, get others involved. So there are so many things that you, you have to focus on. We can't, we can't, um, you know, we, we can't say, okay, this, you know, it's more important to go to this threat or that threat. We have to try and focus on all the threats. Um, so, you know, that's what we do. And we do it in, in many different ways. And we don't do it alone. We do it, you know, with our federal partners and we do it in our century program with all our departments that we have around the country that we interact with and, and our international program. So, you know, um, you know, spreading the resources out amongst other agencies and other partners, you know, that's how you kind of address all the, all the threats. I so, think that key part, mm -hmm. part about youth is really important and that brings this audience into the conversation in a really important way because the criminal justice system isn't really well set up to deal with kids who are 12, 13, 14 who are either involved in shootings or as Chief Galati just explained um, making heinous threats um, 
that span from pure crime to more ideological or incel. Uh, so we need to have the help of parents' communities when available and when not, a lot of mental health experts and, mm -hmm. and communities, because these kids aren't going to suddenly just flip a switch and become functional members of society without a lot of intervention from all of us. Yeah, I think that that line between being a kid, being a kid who might become someone who's violent, being a kid who might become someone who's violent and commits a violent crime, being a kid who might become someone who's violent who commits a violent crime, and then when you look at their Facebook page later, or whatever passes for a Facebook page now for someone who's not my age, you know, um, they look like suddenly they have tattoos and a beard, and they're standing with three other people with gang symbols. That timeline seems to have gotten faster, and one of the questions that, and this is sort of the lead into the question is, you know, are we doing enough in the communities? But Rebecca's kind of answered part of that, I think, which is how much of this burden should be on law enforcement and are the other agencies involved in this doing enough? We don't really want these people in the criminal justice system. We want to stop this before it gets there. Sheriff Stanek, you dealt with these community issues in the not one Muslim community in Minnesota, but the Muslim communities in Minnesota. How did you work with the other agencies? What could we learn from your experience? Yeah, thank you. Well, like I said, we had several hundred thousand folks from diaspora communities that we had to merge together, and they did not want to assimilate. They wanted to integrate. But we did a lot of different things. Sometimes we did it right, sometimes maybe not so good. But I think about, like, we would try uh, one-day citizen academies. Most of our agencies have some type of law enforcement citizen academy, but you're going to be hard-pressed to find uh, East African woman or Somali male to attend, uh, you know, the next 16 weeks for three hours a night on Wednesdays or something. It just isn't going to happen. So we would condense it into a morning or an afternoon, maybe on a Saturday. And it would be culturally specific to them in terms of the food uh, we had, in terms of the presenters, uh, being cognizant of prayer times if that's what they needed. Uh, whatever it took, we wanted to help them understand the criminal justice system. Be surprised how many of these immigrants had no clue when the police, when the school resource officer would come visit the house or the apartment that they lived in and say, your kid hasn't been in school, and they say, well, what's that? You know, what's, what's being truant? Uh, what's a curfew violation? Uh, what does it mean when they say, well, you have to, you know, do this or do that, and you get these letters from the courts? They, they, had, they had no idea about the criminal justice system, so we tried to help them understand. We uh, worked with them by empowering other uh, East African women to then be able to present and facilitate these classes. And if we did it on a Saturday, we provided some of our officers and others child care for the moms, right? I mean, you're not going to expect them to leave their kids somewhere. They didn't have the resources, the ability to be able to to do that. So there's a lot of different ways to reach out. I was just looking at something about uh, the Faith in Blue weekend, right? We've done this now, I think, the, the third time. It's coming up here in mid-October. Law enforcement agencies across the country will be working with the faith community uh, and others uh, on community outreach. It is kind of a, you know, kind of a next generation. We used to talk about community-oriented Policing. Well, that's 25 plus years ago. So you're always looking for the next generation of it uh, being able to to reach out. And, and just one other quick thing, Rich. Before we go, we have you know, we heard a lot today about intelligence and intelligence sharing. But the IACP, Vince Tellucci, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Mayorkas, they have put together a, a working group and about uh, criminal intelligence sharing and how feds and local law enforcement do it and how we haven't been doing it so well of recent. And, you know, Vince is here. You should take advantage of his expertise for two minutes like we did with Tom and ask him about this collaborative effort and where it's headed and how it benefits all of us in the room, whether you're in law enforcement or you're an average citizen 
or just someone who's keenly interested in what it is that we're doing? Okay, we, I think we have enough time to get Vince to answer Vince, that mind? question. Um, we just met a couple weeks ago. It's, 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 it's moving you know, on great. It's your turn to, but Tom, you can't really go too seat. far. <laughs> <laughs> For at least a minute or two. So, thank you, Sheriff. Um, so, IACP um, convened the meeting immediately after 9-11. Conversations preceded that, but talked about developing a critical information uh, intelligence sharing uh, plan, of which I won't bore you with details, but a lot of the um, inner collaboration between associations, between federal, state, and local law enforcement emanated from um, those meetings. Um, we had a subsequent meeting uh, later in the aughts, but there's been a dearth of consolidated, good, coordinated discussions other than impromptu, ad hoc, uh, issue-based discussions versus having a strategic plan relative to where we're going and what that, what that coordination looks like on an ongoing basis. So what you end up having is um, conversations on an ad hoc basis as needed versus thinking through what that strategic plan should look like. So um, one of the things we were pressing for at the ISP for a long time was to have another thorough sit down discussion regarding what that structure should look like, what the fusion center expectations should be from a state and local perspective and vice versa. Um, and we just held that meeting, uh, I think about a month ago now, um, to really think through what that should be convening from all quarters of state and local law enforcement, um, uh, but with the promise from FBI, DHS, to ensure that we're all working on the same page relative to making sure that we're all pulling an oar in the same direction. So uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. There's a lot of great work that's been done already, but we want to make sure that we iron out the difficulties prior to um, the next big issue. Uh, because again, I'm on all these emails about you know the, the difficulties with information sharing right now that I think could be resolved by having regular ongoing discussions with the federal uh, level officials. So Rich, before we close, I'll just use my prerogative to wrap this up. Um, one of the, we, a lot of men and a lot of women have just come home from a long war. And we were going to the supermarket while they were going to war. Just as our society has forgotten those women, those men, perhaps we should consider telling our society what you guys are doing. We all tend to talk to ourselves. That's one of the echo chamber effects. but. Maybe I would just like to leave that as a closing thought that we might consider that educating people in the continuing war on terror and the continuing value of our stakeholders is a mission that we perhaps don't put enough resources to. I'm basing that as someone who has spent a little time on the inside and a lot of time on the outside looking at this, these very issues. So I want to thank everyone on the panel and our hot seat guest panelists. <laughs> um, for, for, and thank you so much for making my job really easy. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Well, thank you to uh, all the presenters there. I, th I know it was just an outstanding uh, pr presentation. I learned a heck of a lot there. And uh, Rich, you did a great job as a host. And uh, Rich, Rebecca, and Sejan. And then pulling off the bench, Tom, I don't think we've uh, thanked you enough for all that NYPD and the coordination that, uh, that you've done. But thanks. And Vince, we pulled you off the bench, too. So we appreciate it. So I'm going to uh, introduce the uh, the break. We're going to take a break till uh, 11:30. Uh, we've got um, uh, an art exhibit out there. Over the 20 years, we've these expressions. I call them expressions of love that have been sent to us as voices. Uh, we've grabbed some of them. So we've got an exhibit out there. If you take a look at that, the Mercury app. If you haven't downloaded it, please do. And uh, we'll plan on reconvening at 11:30. Thank you.